All right, we, we might kick off and then we can add extra people as they join in. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christabel Darcy. I'm the co-convener of the Northern Territory AES along with Cat Street. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of um, the Darwin area where we are um, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that our gathering today includes um, a range of lands across Australia. Uh, our presenters today are Mark Galvin and Melissa Coltner from EY. Um, the presentation was originally planned to be an in-person event in Darwin um, earlier in the year, but was postponed due to COVID-19. Um, so a big thank you to Mark and Melissa for being flexible uh, and agreeing to do the presentation via Zoom today instead. Uh, Mark is a partner um, at EY's government and public sector practice and leads the firm's evaluation practice network. Uh, he's an economist uh, and an evaluator with nearly 20 years experience in a professional advisory consultant. Dr. Melissa Coltner is an associate director uh, in EY where she leads their human services evaluation projects. The presentation today is about driving sustained change in child protection through action learning. Uh, and it's a case study of open adoption from care. Mark will speak about the experience of the adoptions task force uh, from care. Uh, and Melissa will add some extra context around child protection and out of home care and some of her previous research. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, uh, we will be recording this. Uh, and please feel free to type any questions that you have in the chat box and we will get to them at the end if we can. Uh, in terms of timing, Mark has another meeting after this one, so we're going to aim to wrap up things at around the 50 minute mark. All right, with that being said, I'm going to hand over Mark and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for that introduction, uh, Christabel. Um, and thank you all for, for choosing to spend an hour of your Wednesday um, with us, wherever you are. Um, I think it's still the morning in Perth, but most of us are in, in our, our afternoon, Wednesday afternoon. Um, uh, firstly, um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land, um, who for me are the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation, which is in the sort of North Sydney, uh, Northern suburbs areas of, of Sydney. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, not only to the Camaragal pe people, but for the traditional custodians of the lands from wherever you happen to be joining us today. Um, and just an important acknowledgement before we start, um, and, and I'd like to acknowledge this from the outset, that the subject matter within this presentation may be somewhat uncomfortable or even distressing for some people on this call. Um, and the reason for that is that it, uh, the, the subject matter, I suppose, it, we, although we're talking about action learning, it is within the context of um, open adoption. And um, and, and we know that generally um, adoption has earned itself a very poor reputation in Australia due to past harmful practices, um, which have impacted and continue to impact on many families uh, in Australia. Uh, thankfully, practice has changed significantly in recent decades and open adoption is practiced throughout Australia. Um, and the practice of open adoption recognises that for some children who can't live safely with their birth families, uh, adoption can support their wellbeing stability, family and cultural connections. Um, current open adoption practice recognises that there is benefit for children when both birth and adoptive families remain connected uh, and a part of the child's life in a meaningful way. Um, in New South Wales, uh, which is where this case study is set, uh, legislation contains what is known as a, a permanency hierarchy. And that recognises that children are better served when they can be returned safely to their birth families. Um, and where this can't be achieved, there are other alternatives that may be considered, including a third party guardianship um, alternative uh, or adoption. And like other Australian states, New South Wales follows the Aboriginal child placement principles. And in legislation in New South Wales, um, adoption is considered the least desirable option for Aboriginal children. And it's normally only um, an option uh, under ex exceptional circumstances. Um, and uh, at to that point, um, I'd like to, or uh, Christabel has already um, introduced my colleague, um, Dr. Melissa Coltner, and I might just add, um, add, add my thanks for, for um, agreeing to participate in the cameo appearance today. 
Um, but um, Melissa's background is, is as an academic researcher and she was um, employed by the department during the time of the Adoptions Transformation Program. And she led some important research uh, that was a precursor to the Adoptions Transformation Program uh, uh, that, that I'll, I'll ask her to, um, to give you an overview of. Thanks, so, so welcome, Melissa. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Mark. Uh, now, we don't have a, a great deal of time, um, but uh, what, we, what we hope to do with you today is, is, is um, talk a little bit about the context, as I said, that research that was a precursor to the Transformation Programme. Um, I'll talk a little bit, little bit about the adoption program itself. You'll, you'll actually learn a little bit um, about adoption as part of this, as well as the methodology that underpins the um, transformation program. Um, and all going to plan, we should have a few minutes towards the end for some questions. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Mel. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I'll give you just a little bit of background. As Mark mentioned, um, I'm a researcher by background. Out of home care is my area of specialty. And at the time, that this work was undertaken that Mark will be talking about today, I was leading a research team within Family and Community Services. Um, I was there doing a range of research, looking at trying to understand the drivers of adoption practice that I'll talk about. But before I move into that, I thought it'd be useful just to give you all a little bit of background on the evidence behind adoption and the reason why adoption is considered, open adoption is considered for some children in care. So we know that um, when children come into care, we're obviously looking to create stability, yet data from New South Wales, and this is similar across the board in Australia, indicates that a large portion of children in care actually experience multiple placements. So at the time when this study was undertaken, almost 40% of children who were in care had experienced three or more placements. And you can imagine that um, even where those placements are planned, placement changes, there's still an impact on attachment for those children as they move between placement to placement. There's been a range of studies which have indicated that there are positive outcomes for children in adoption relative to foster care. Some of that's about less placement breakdown and about having more stability for children in care. There's been some studies that have suggested that there are better developmental outcomes for children as well, so well-being outcomes, education outcomes too, stronger sense of self-reported security and belonging in children who are adopted relative to those who remain in foster care. And some Australian studies which have highlighted positive outcomes for children, including a Bernardo's study that you may have seen. So Bernardo's actually went back and retrospectively looked through 30 years worth of their adoptions of children from care, contacted those families and those children um, and studied their trajectories. And what they found was that children had um, high rates of sense of stability and belonging to their families. They had stayed connected with their adoptive families and with their birth families going forward. So there's some really interesting work there around the continuation of um, relationships between birth families and adoptive families and those children as they're adopted from care. Mark, I'll get you to move to the next slide. Um, at the time that I was leading research work in this space, we were looking to understand what was actually driving practice. So although we, there was legislation in place to enable adoption from care, there was fairly minimal numbers of children who were actually being considered for adoption. And we were wanting to understand what was driving that. Um, there were some perceptions that there was a, due to the history of poor practice in adoption, which Mark mentioned, that there was a bit of a bias, if you will, from the front line and that the front line weren't actually um, ideologically on board with the idea of adoption. And so the suggestion was that the frontline um, child protection practitioners weren't actually considering adoption and then that was a big barrier for practice. So we wanted to understand what was actually underpinning practice. And in talking with um, stakeholders, we realised that actually there was very little evidence base upon which that idea was based, that um, practitioners did have that bias. And so we went out and surveyed a range of practitioners across both um, BACS practitioners and NGOs. So in, um, in New South Wales, our practice is divided so that we have about 50% of our children in out-of-home care sit within the NGO sector and 50% within BACS at this, at this time. So we did surveys with a large number of um, practitioners and then we also did interviews with a smaller number of practitioners to understand what was really driving practice. And what we found was that in the main, most practitioners, um, the vast majority of practitioners actually felt that open adoption could serve the needs of some children in care, but the barriers for them were more around capability, not understanding how to actually go through the process, capacity, 
obviously in um, out-of-home care generally, caseworkers tend to be fairly stretched for time and the idea of having to integrate the additional service burden that was necessary to consider adoption for a child in care was also a barrier. Communication, so a, a large number of our caseworkers indicated that actually they didn't feel confident to even have a conversation about open adoption with birth families. So they didn't know how to make those steps. Um, and culture was only a small component of what was driving practice or lack thereof in that space. One of the other things that came up throughout our study was the process issues. And to that end, we then spoke to EY and engaged Mark and his team to come and have a look and understand what was actually driving some of the long processes. So at the time, and I think probably Mark, I'm about to step on some of the content that you've got, but at the time there was about a four and a half year period um, from a person, a carer, actually expressing interest in wanting to adopt a child to that order being granted. And there were a range of issues in process that were occurring. So we then um, contracted EY, and I'll hand over to Mark to talk a little bit about some of the work that Mark then did in that space. Great, thank, thanks Mel. Uh, so this, um, this just gives you a, a bit of a quick snapshot of the situation as it was in uh, 2017. I think it was about uh, June 2017, as the Adoption Transformation Program got underway. Uh, so the number of children in, in care, which, which, I, which I think is uh, more or less the same as it is now, um, uh, was around 20,000 children. That's in some form of care, whether it be foster care, residential care or another type of care. Um, most of these kids are in um, or have a long term care order. Um, so that means that they will essentially be in foster care um, until the age of 18. Um, and they will spend on average about 13 years um, in care. Uh, there, as far as adoptions were concerned, there were over 500 matters um, in an adoption process or children in an adoption process. So um, now these are all, when we talk about adoption in this context, we're talking about um, foster carers electing to um, adopt the child that they're already caring for. So this usually happens um, within sort of one to two years if a, if a foster carer is interested in adoption, um, they can enter the process at that point. Um, and I, I think Mel, you mentioned um, they were taking about four and a half years. The, the, the figure we had at that time was, was 5.2 years. Some were taking seven years. There was even one that was taking 10 years. And so if you think about the amount of time um, out of a child's childhood, that when you're in this uncertain process, um, you know, that, that was just unacceptable um, to everyone. Um, New South Wales was doing the most adoptions from foster care at the time and, and is still doing the most foster, foster care adoptions um, in Australia by, by a long way. At that time um, in 2015-16, there had been 67 adoption orders made in New South Wales. So when we, when we came in, we were faced with a whole uh, set of circumstances in that uh, the, the adoptions process was a persistent problem in terms of the length of time it was taking um, and the, the, the sort of confused process that had been built up over many, many years. Um, there, were, there were cultural issues at play, um, potentially that, that Mel alluded to in her research. Um, and adoptions was, was a low priority. And the reason I say that is that the model that was, um, was, was used and is still used within the department to some extent is that there's a significant um, uh, a reliance on caseworkers to progress an adoption matter. So, although there are regional adoption coordinators, uh, it, it's caseworkers that are that are performing the casework and 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 preparing the um, or pulling together the the evidence that that the court requires for an adoption order. Now, you can imagine um, with high caseloads that caseworkers have a number of competing priorities, and and they are quite rightly um, focused on the more pointy end of child protection rather than uh, processing an adoption um, for a child who's in a safe and stable environment. And so that was, that was part of the reason why, why there was such a long time frame involved. Um, so this isn't a presentation on how adoptions are done in New South Wales, but it's important to have some context um, as, I, as I sort of talk more about the, um, the way in which we approached it. Um, so there's, it, it's essentially a five stage um, process, or, although there is some blurring between the, um, the different phases. Um, so as I said, if a foster care is interested in caring for, uh, in adopting the child in their care, they will make an inquiry and they'll be asked to attend a seminar 
um, the the seminar will will talk to them about what it what, what's involved in the adoption process and what's and, and some of the sort of more future um, elements of, of, of adopting a child. Um, if the carer is still interested following the seminar, um, you move into an assessment stage and that assessment is typically done by an external party. It doesn't have to be, but um, they're essentially uh, mostly contracted out to independent um, assessors. And that assessment will assess the carer's suitability uh, to become an adoptive parent. Now they've already been assessed and vetted as a foster carer, uh, but there are other elements as you'd, as you'd appreciate um, involved in, in actually adopting a child. Um, the approval and finalization stage is where um, the, uh, it's, it's where most of the, the documents are prepared for court. So the affidavits um, and other, and other uh, court requirements, um, birth certificates, marriage certificates, um, medical records and so forth. Um, within that phase, there's often a lot of work going on in terms of um, locating birth parents, which, you, um, which, which is actually something that occurs in, in, in a large number of these cases. Um, generally, it's about tracking down a, a father or a mother who has, for whatever reason, um, not, not on the radar anymore. Uh, and so that, that can also take a significant amount of time. Um, then the application is made to the New South Wales Supreme Court, which is quite unique in Australia. Most, um, it's the only, I think it's the only jurisdiction in Australia where the Supreme Court is actually the um, determining, determining court. Um, the application is made, the birth parents are served um, and given a period to respond. They may or may not at that point contest the adoption. Um, and whether it's contested or not, there is a, a court process associated with um, then making the order. So, the, the elapsed time in each of those stages of the process are given there below. So you can see it's that approval and finalisation stage where all of that casework and legal work is being done. That was driving um, a lot of that time. But also, you, um, as I said, foster carers are already assessed um, and vetted as foster carers. So one and a half years almost for assessing them for their suitability to be adopted parents was also an area that um, raised a few questions in this process. Um, we're going to talk about uh, action learning um, as, as what underpinned the adoption transformation program. But on it, and it's, it's a bit of a confession, I suppose, is that we did not approach this with, with, a, with a particular methodology in mind. In fact, we almost retrofitted what we had done to, to a methodology that, was, that already existed. We approached it like it was a problem. And, we, and, and like you approach any problem, um, you, you look at, uh, you, you try to understand what's going on, you try to identify areas which, which can be improved, and you set up a model um, whereby you can learn continuously and reflect and introduce changes um, rapidly. Um, it was important at, at this point that we had the sponsorship and the, the authority, I suppose, to do things differently as well. Um, and, and, and we undertook a rapid discovery phase where we identified several, um, several I guess, key issues is that the process um, was at risk of moving away from having children at its core. There was a, a little bit of what I might call form over substance in terms of um, a, a strong focus on the evidentiary requirements and ticking all the boxes and, and making sure that all of that was already for court, which is really important, but um, perhaps less of an emphasis on communication, on, on engagement of the various stakeholders involved. Um, and, and transparency, I suppose, in the process. We, we noted um, that prospective adoptive parents were required to um, comply with a whole lot of legal requirements and other requirements, um, but they were not necessarily engaged and involved in, in the decisions. And, and we felt that um, as, as the foster carers who were looking to become adoptive parents were ultimately the people who would be providing permanency for the child, that there was scope there to bring them closer to the process. Um, we, we, we found that data was limited and it wasn't in real time. So we, we had to wait a certain period of time until we got age, what they call age data, to allow time for caseworkers to enter information and so forth. Now that's really important when you need absolute accuracy and you're using it for reporting for, to, particularly to external parties. But what we were after was, was sufficient information to, to guide our decision making. Um, and we didn't mind if it, was, if, if it wasn't quite as accurate as it needed to be, but it was just sufficient to, um, to help us understand if we were on the right track. And so we, we undertook a, um, quite a significant negotiation internally um, for the use of real-time data, or close to real-time, 
um, that was sort of em embargoed, so it, so we weren't using it for any any reporting purposes. Um, and we and we looked at the performance measures that were in place, and and um, the the performance measures used were the number of orders that were being made. But as you can see, as you saw in the previous diagram, um, a lot of that once you put the application in court, a lot of that is down to the court. The uh, the, the department, um, the NGOs involved in this process, have no no influence whatsoever. Um, on the timing for that matter, once it once it actually enters the court, and so we 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 changed the we changed the performance measure to something that was actually able to be influenced, which was getting the getting the um, the paperwork together and making the application. So applications to court became our new um, performance measure. Um, we also found that the process is quite disjointed. Um, so we have um, in New South Wales we have the department um, processing uh, a large number of matters itself. We have one or two um, accredited agencies. One of them is Bernardo's, which is fully accredited to run end-to-end -end adoption processes without involvement from the department and make the applications to court in its own right. Um, and we have another of other NGOs of varying, um, with varying experience of adoption um, that, are lit, that are relying on support from the department um, in, in processing those adoptions. So, so, and we have birth parents and we have um, uh, the, the um, Crown Solicitor's Office, the Supreme Court. We have a number of stakeholders involved um, and, and it was very much a, uh, quite a siloed process isn't it? and sort of handoff points at each stage. Um, so we, we sought to understand how we could bring, bring more of a multidisciplinary focus and an end-to-end an -end visibility across the, um, across the process. And the other thing was that we had um, a significant pressure, I suppose, coming, um, political pressure, uh, on ensuring that we maintained the re required level of quality in, in the process that was satisfied, you know, that satisfied the court's evidentiary requirements. But there was an expectation that by changing this process and minimising the time, there would be a lot more adoption orders in the process. So it was on us to ensure that we had some quick and early wins, if you like, um, to demonstrate the efficacy of what we were trying to do. But we also didn't want to slow down the process. And, because, and as I said, the process was, had evolved over a number of years, um, policies and requirements and, and forms, but had never really been reviewed and really stripped back to the legislation and built out again. And, the, and, and, and we, we found that um, had, we, had we decided to work closely with the existing team, there was a real, really real risk that we would actually slow down the adoptions as a result of changing things. And we wanted to ensure that, that the adoption process was not disrupted in this way. One of, our, one of our underpinning principles was that no child would be worse off in terms of the time it would take um, in this process by our intervention. And we surrounded ourselves with the right legal and casework um, advice as we went. So what we um, decided uh, in consultation with the department to do is to set up a parallel but, in, but, but quite autonomous and independent process, um, using real-time data to inform what we were doing, to, to um, break down the silos by establishing a multidisciplinary team. So we had case workers, we had legal people, we had policy people, and, um, and, and uh, a number of paralegals and so forth. Um, we, we, took the, we, we tried to understand how we could triage this 500 odd cases in the backlog of, of adoption matters. And we, we looked for the things that were taking time. So as I said, one of them was finding birth parents where they were unable to be found. One of them was whether the, whether the child had siblings that needed to be considered as part of the contact arrangements in the adoption process. Um, and a whole range of other things that, that had a relationship with, a, with how long it was taking. Um, and initially we did some triage to identify those cases that we thought we could move relatively quickly. So where the birth parents had consented, um, and, and, and some of those other, other factors weren't, weren't at play. Um, and that way we thought we would optimise the process for the whole group by, by doing that uh, triage process. We established an incubator model with some of the NGOs. As I said, um, some of them were really uh, experienced at undertaking um, adoptions and others were, were really embarking on this for the first time. Um, and so we, we established a process whereby we worked hand in hand with some of those agencies. Anglicare was one of them. Um, to support them in their in their journey, um, we we looked into that independent assessor uh, stage that I mentioned earlier, and we found that there were no real um, expectations around timeframes. 
placed on those assessors. And um, as a result of that, and also there was there was no sort of um, uh, understanding of the workload of the assessors before um, matters were referred to them. And so we looked to rebalance the workload to ensure that um, there were manageable workloads uh, across the assessor pool. And we developed our own training material and um, bought some of the assessments in-house to see if we could trial that internally as well. Um, and as I said, we were getting continuous, uh, continuously getting legal advice along the way. We had stand-up meetings daily and we were encouraged to try, test and learn. Um, we, we kept a, a, a log of ideas that we would um, review every day. Um, and we, as, as I said, we had the permission to change things rapidly. So there were some things we could do straight away and we just enacted it. And there were other things that would take more of a consultation process and we put those into a, um, into a different um, process by which we could work on achieving those. Um, I, I put this slide in because um, I found it really helpful um, at the start of this project in communicating to the various stakeholders about what it is we were trying to, to achieve. And I think any, any project like this where the answer is uncertain requires a good visual diagram <laughs> as a basis for some of these consultations. Um, so what we what we what this diagram is essentially saying is that um, when the adoptions task force was established, as I said, we did that triaging process and we and we were identifying those cases we thought we could move quite quickly. These ones were usually in the latter phases of an adoption process, and so initially um, that that's the adoption task force there pushing a weight of files um, towards the end line. Um, now that would require the established adoption services team to do some more of the pulling and the pushing. So that is bringing cases forward from earlier stages of the process, um, uh, rather than focusing solely on those that were in those latter stages like the task force was. If we were both doing that, we'd, we'd get a short term gain in terms of um, reduced timeframes for those cases, but we needed to be pulling those through. And once the task force had finished that initial work, we could also then round back and start pulling through cases from earlier phases um, in the diagram. So, so excuse my PowerPoint skills, but I, I found that a really effective diagram to have a lot of those conversations. Um, some examples of the um, reporting tools we use. As I said, the, the performance, frame rate, performance management regime was, um, uh, was a bit limited and the data was not helpful. And, and as I said, it was age data. So you were looking at it a month out of date. Uh, and this is what, where we were using the real time data um, to have weekly meetings with our sponsors and um, the head of adoption services and, and others to really just go through for each um, entity, so the adoption services, the adoptions task force and Bernardo's being the major, major NGO player, to, to track forecast and actual applications to court, not orders, but applications to court. Um, now, you the, the, the difference between the forecast and the actuals in those early days was quite, um, the difference was quite significant, but as we started to learn more about the process and more about how long things took and more about the drivers of time, um, you could see those forecasts and actuals coming closer together. And so we sat down at these meetings, we had no, no other materials, no briefing notes and papers and things like that. We sat down with one page and that was the page and we just talked through where things were at. And it really, did a, it, it really worked wonders in terms of making transparent the progress but also making uh, driving accountability um, for what you forecast. And if it wasn't um, on forecast, it, you know, there, there's um, an onus to provide some explanatory information as to why. Um, so that was the, that was the weekly um, sponsor meeting. The case tracking tool is another tool we used internally. Um, so we, one of the things that um, was, we, 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 we think we improved a lot was that we had more interaction with the Supreme Court. Now, obviously there are reasons why you don't wanna, uh, well, you can't get too close to the court in terms of um, operations and the legal side of things because they need to be independent. Um, and there were very formal protocols as to how we engaged the court when we started. However, we built relationships with the court um, registrars and administrators so that we could inquire on the status of, of matters that were at court. Um, and, and, and when, they had requ uh, when they had requisitions, which is, which is when they come back and ask for further information, we were able to, um, to head some of those off by saying, you know, if, if, if there was a um, copy of a birth certificate and they needed an original, you were able to demonstrate 
um, that you had pulled up, upturned every single stone to find that to find that um, uh, that piece of information, and it would save save weeks. But by the time you got a requisition, investigated it, came back. Da, da, da. So we cut all that out. Um, the court had indicated that they would endeavour to um, turn around adoption matters that, that um, after an application was made within 60 days, if they were uncontested. Um, and so those orange um, lines there are all the matters that were over 60 days at that particular time. And so that made that that made us um, allowed us to have those conversations with the registrar and in, in about inquiring about about um, status. Um, we what I call um, myth busting. So we busted a lot of myths along the way. Now, if you were looking at an adoption process and you were starting with a blank canvas, these are the sorts of things that you would want to be considering um, along the way. What we had was a legacy system, which we had to pretty much strip back and challenge the things that just didn't look right. Um, or there were um, alternative ways that um, we would like to, that we wanted to try. Um, so I won't go through all of these, but and, they, and these are really quite straightforward things. So at the time, there was a policy in place that police checks for prospective adoptive parents um, needed to be done by New South Wales Police. Um, now that required attending in person. Um, it, 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 there was a charge, and it took a period of time to receive that police check. Now there are other agencies that rely on exactly the same database as police providing that service. You don't have to um, attend in person. Um, it's, it, it, it costs less um, and it, it takes less time. So it's, well, we were challenging these sorts of things. So why does it have to be New South Wales Police? Why can't we do it another way? As I said, legal advice all the time as to why we could or couldn't do something. Um, you know, there, there was this, this um, uh, prevailing view that, um, that everything that was re um, required by court needed to be original documentation. We discovered that that wasn't actually the case. Um, and that in, in some circumstances they would accept um, non-originals and photocopies. Um, the um, on hold matters. So, it, so when we when we looked at the data around adoptions, we saw a number of these matters were on hold. And when we when we looked into that, a number of them were not on hold for any reason to do with the adoptive parents or the or the circumstances around the child, but for um, but for administrative reasons on on the on the behalf of the department. Um, and so we we really just got underneath that to just understand why matters were on hold and which were the genuine things that should be on hold and which were the ones that could possibly be reenacted. Um, we, we were often told, particularly at the start, how complex adoptions were. Um, now, in, in saying that, um, if, you're, if you're not processing, if you're not involved in the adoptions process in New South Wales, um, there, there isn't really an established uh, and, and you know, way of doing it. I mean, so so anyone who was doing it in New South Wales were probably close to being the experts in the country. Um, however, it's really just real. It's really just good casework and good interaction with your legal um, your legal people. So, you know, there's this myth that it was such a complex process. It's um, you know, it's difficult. It's it's hard. It's hard yakka, and it's um, uh, but it really is good casework. Um, locating birth parents, so an enormous amount of time was spent tracking down, usually birth fathers, I have to say, um, who had for whatever reason disappeared off the radar or were not easily found. Um, every stone was upturned, um, every, every database explored, every phone call made, um, but there was no sense of well, how long, at what point do you say we, we've done everything we can? Um, and so there were, there were yeah, you know, in some circumstances, over 12 months of trying to find a particular uh, birth father um, and so on. The, the court doesn't require you to find the, the, um, the birth family uh, if you have made every endeavour to do so and you can demonstrate that. And, that, and that's, so we enacted that. And it doesn't mean that that search doesn't continue beyond the adoption as well. So, th so these are just some of the, just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that we were told were truths um, that we challenged uh, and uh, were able to come up with alternative ways to do it without compromising um, quality, but certainly in ensuring that the, the process was more streamlined for um, the children and, and adoptive parents and birth parents involved in this. Uh, tell me if I'm running out of time, won't you, Christabel? Um, so this is the slide which just shows um, where we where we were in, in terms of the 67 adoption orders made in 2015-16, um, where we got to within one year as a result of doing some of the things I've talked about. Um, 
1718, uh, there was a new record set at 140. Uh, now that's when the adoption transformation program stepped away. So the, the task force that I talked about went into operations. Um, it maintained um, some autonomy or, or it was under the same um, uh, uh, hierarchy uh, of, um, of management. Um, and they're looking now to, to further integrate it properly. But for a while it did kind of operate as it was, but we just sort of changed the way they reported and EY stepped out. Um, and, and this is probably what I'm most proud of in this whole process is that the numbers of adoptions were sustained. Um, not only sustained, but vastly improved, as you see there in 2019 to 20, uh, 20, 162. So 140% more increase um, from that 2015-16 figure. And this is not necessarily um, an increase in underlying demand for adoptions. This is, the, this is the result of a clearing of a backlog of matters um, and undertaking the adoption process in half the time. Um, so, so those numbers are not, um, as I said, necessarily an increase in underlying demand, um, but a really great, great, um, a great example, I, I think, of, of how, uh, you know, a, you know, challenging ways of doing things, doing things differently, measuring the performance and success of those things and transitioning them back into the business as usual um, within the public sector. I think it's an ex excellent example of, um, uh, of how that was done. Um, we, we received a number of um, very generous uh, feedback and positive feedback along the way, but I think this one really captures what we were trying to uh, achieve and how, we, and, and how we were trying to do things. Um, you know, this, this, this um, recognition that we were working collaboratively, this is with Anglicare in our incubator hub, um, providing prompt and accurate and legislatively informed uh, um, advice. So think communication, communication was an absolute key uh, within this. Um, providing meaningful reports on progress. Um, it, you know, this is about keeping everyone in the loop in terms of where things are at with their matter. Um, and, and, and you know, not this information deficit that was present when we, um, when we stepped in. Um, you know, there've been, and, and you know, there's been this um, increased capacity for change and to negotiate and embrace change. Um, we, as I said, we had stand-up meetings every day, and we and we were constantly reflecting and trialing new things. But we also had a couple of independent um, uh, evaluations that were done. Um, I, I'd call them more pulse checks than 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 evaluations because they were quite rapid. Um, but it just did give us an independent view of of an, out, of an observer looking in as to what they saw was working and, and what could be improved. And as a result of those uh, those um, evaluations, we. We changed our we changed our model. We renegotiated a contract with the Crown Solicitor's Office to to flex um, to flex it more. Um, we focused on the Supreme Court relationship. As I said, that was that moved from an extremely formal uh, relationship um, to at least some interaction at the registrar level around the status and, and progress of matters. Um, you know the dialogue around requisitions, which I talked about. Um, a real simple thing, in, in the districts, uh, the, the uh, manager casework signs off on the adoption matter when, all, when the file is put before them. Um, they, there's, they've usually got a pile of files on their desk for sign-offs and it's not an, an insignificant thing for someone to sign off on someone's adoption. Um, and so we found that they were often sitting there uh, for some time before they actually got signed off. So we introduced warm sign-offs, so that is we, we set up an appointment with those managers. We, a caseworker had been working on the um, the adoption matter would go along to, to talk about the case, to answer any questions that might might come up, and um, and and get those. And, and we just found that that really just saved a lot of time in um, in getting those sign offs. Um, yeah, so there's just some of the things that we changed as a result of the um, independent evaluation. Um, and I think the as evaluators, the experience um, really highlights the the role of um, for I guess non-traditional evaluation methodologies or more formative evaluations, but with an emphasis on implementation and practice, uh, where we, you need to understand what's, what's, what it takes to achieve successful implementation, um, to understand the, um, uh, the critical questions that need to be answered uh, in terms of implementation, but also the adaptations that are necessary to achieve optimal, optimal change. So I think they're, they're sort of the, the, the main, the main things for consideration. Now I will 
probably pause there. Um, so I think, uh, I think we'll probably take some questions. That's great. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, we have got a couple of questions coming up through the chat, um, but I've just got a couple to start off with. Firstly, just to clarify, when we talk about open adoption, we're talking about foster carers who are already caring for these children, adopting their children. Is that correct? That's right. Yep. Yep. So the average, the average age of a child adopted by their carer is um, seven years old. And when we talked about that, um, that delay of around five years in that process, that was particularly for open adoption or for all types of adoption? Uh, specific to uh, adoptions from foster care. Yeah. So there being that delay of five years, even though that person was currently the child's foster carer. That's correct, yeah. Okay, cool, just wanted to clarify. Um, all right, and um, in one of your slides, you had a dot point around a cost effectiveness analysis. Is that something that you did? Yes, we did do that, yeah. Um, so we, we gathered um, a whole lot of information about um, how it was cost, what it was costing um, to undertake the process uh, in the status quo versus the, um, the task force model. Um, and we, we found that there was, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to cost caseworker time because they're sharing it amongst uh, uh, adoption process and, and home visits and, and, all, and all of that, everything else that they, they undertake. Um, but we estimated between sort of 20 and 30% um, uh, more cost effective to, to undertake it in the way that, in the model that we had um, established. Um, thank you. Um, We've got a couple of questions coming in, so I might start going through them. Um, this one is from Salek McBride. Uh, given the length of time taken to potentially receive data due to the length of time in the adoption process, resulting in smaller variable samples, how do you ensure quality in the data you're reporting and making decisions on? Yeah, um, well, we get, we, we're, we're talking to the, we're getting it from the horse's mouth, if, if, um, if that makes sense. So, um, as I said, it, the data we were using day to day was not data that was reported out, outside of the um, outside of the team and and our sponsors. And we used it to um, we used it to guide our, our decisions on what we might do next. Um, and and I guess um, and, we, and we we also had it stamped so that it wasn't going anywhere else. Um, but it was. Um, it was just really useful, and I guess experience was the main thing. So we 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 could see um, where where a matter had been last time and where it had progressed, and we could see that oh well, that's reasonable, you know. Um, and yeah, I guess just talking to people who were just close to the cases that could actually validate um, some of the data that we were getting. Sorry, does, does that answer the question? <laughs> um, yeah, it is. It is a tricky one because. Um, You've got a smaller a smaller pool there, um, but it is one of those ones where you probably need to use that qualitative data to to back it oh, up. Absolutely, yeah. And we always, we would always um, when the actual reports came out, we'd always be sort of validating what we were seeing day to day uh, versus what was reported. Um, there's always missing data because it it just takes time for people to enter information into the system and and so forth. But like I said, if we're actually talking to those people and they're telling us um, about a matter that they haven't yet entered, but they're going to tomorrow, then it was counted as you know, real time information that we could use. Um, we've got a question here from Mary Welsh. Has the ATP approach in this instance been documented? Were there any publications as a result of EY's approach? No, and it's something that um, Mel is always um, talking to me about because um, it's something that we should we should write up. Um, it's been, this, um, presentations similar to this one have been given at various conferences, AES, uh, presented at ICAR, which is the International Adoption um, uh, Conference in Montreal uh, and, and other places. So, but, but no, it hasn't been written up formally and, and it's something on my to-do list for sure. It will be, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got another question here from Rebecca Roebuck. Um, she says she was interested in the ongoing legal advice and she wants to know whether it was external to the department or in-house counsel. Yeah. Um, so we got we got legal advice from um, internally on the, uh, from the department, um, particularly in thing. Uh, so so for instance, um, in the at the start we had a um, we had a team of of contracted caseworkers who worked remotely. So we found it was more efficient to be um, in the field and and located in the field rather than coming to a central place. 
that meant uh, that meant um, taking files off site. And so we we were told initially that that wasn't going to be able to happen. But um, we got the legal advice that as long as there was demonstrated, you could demonstrate you could keep it secure. Um, that there was a you know a, a proper contract between the subcontractors and the department, which there was. Um, with uh, confidentiality uh, requirements and, and so forth, then, then that was acceptable. So that's the sort of advice we were getting, sort of really just day-to-day -day, um, practical legal advice. Advice on the court process we were getting from um, the, we had, like I said, we had, we had a, um, a flexible contract with the, um, uh, now the name escapes me, the um, CSO, the, the court, uh, Crown Solicitor's Office in New South Wales. Um, whereby that they, they would advise us on more of the, the sort of legal process type information um, and advice and sort of court processes as well. Um, we have another question here from Natalie Hunter. Have you had discussion with SNAICC, the Peak Aboriginal Childcare Agency, in reference to adopting out ATSI children? Um, yeah, so we recently did some work for the Commonwealth um, around the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, where we partnered with SNAKE um, around, it was more around um, all elements of permanency and the application of the Aboriginal Child Placement Principles. Uh, so we have a very good relationship with, with SNAKE and we, we're, um, as I said, acknowledged up the front, um, very much mindful of um, how adoption is um, is viewed by uh, many Aboriginal people and, and very sensitive to that. Yeah, and just to reiterate that point, um, at the time when the department was working in this space, um, we were very conscious of ensuring that we adhere to the Aboriginal placement principles. And so adoption for Aboriginal children, as Mark mentioned up front, is the least, um, the least preferential option for their care. So it's something that happens only by very rare exception and wasn't the focus of the work yeah. that we've been uh, talking about. I might just add, add just yeah. in case it's not clear to anyone, um, we, we had no say whatsoever in um, in what children were in an adoption process. We, we sort of, um, that, that decision had been made and um, we, we, we came in at that point where that inquiry had been made and ensuring that that process was as, um, as streamlined as it could be, given the evidentiary requirements um, of the court. Um, and I've just got um, one final question, um, I think just around change management. Um, so, you know, you, you showed that graph which talked about um, how even after EY had stepped out, um, those adoptions were still um, at really good levels. Um, do you have much of a sense of how many of those processes from the task force were actually transferred into mainstream and, and if so, um, how that was handled? That might be one for you, Melissa, as well, perhaps. I like um, Yeah, and I might, I might just acknowledge that this isn't just EY. It was, a, it was an absolute collective effort um, with Bernardo's undertaking a number, quite a large portion of those adoptions, um, and obviously the department, the Anglo Care and the NGOs that we, that we worked with. So um, we were really, um, I guess, the administrators uh, ensuring we executed on the design and, and the model and so forth. But uh, we had a fantastic team of casework professionals, legal professionals doing the actual work. So um, I, re I really found my job was really helping to pave the way and let them do what they did best. Um, so I just want to say that, that up front, but, but maybe Mel, you can pick up on how the um, yeah. uh, case is going back into the status quo. Well, I think um, in terms of Christabella, you're meaning more in terms of transition to BAU from the yes. task force team? Yeah. Yes. Um, so that's been a long process. I think Mark alluded to it for quite some time. The task force operated separately. And so some of that, yeah. you know, testing was occurring for a number of years before then transitioning in. And it's really only been in the last, um, Mark, is it the last year that it's transitioned across, which I can't speak to from a department perspective because I've moved across to EY over that time. But from what we've heard, it's gone particularly well. And so it, most of those um, those refinements to process have been adopted within the yeah. overall team now. So, and it's just one single team. So they have transitioned all back to BAU. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And right, as well, I I'm mentioned, maintain those numbers throughout. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I am conscious of time, so we'd better wrap it up there. But um, Mark and Melissa, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a really interesting discussion. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, yeah, Christabel, thanks, thanks to us. everyone who joined. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all.